We will. We are live, sir. All right. I don't like being live. So much better than me. Give it a opposite. Give it a moment for people to catch up and join in with us. Cool. Since we're coming on just a little bit late. Right on. Hi, everybody. If hey, you guys. If you're on, I can't see you yet. Gary Johnson. Is Gary already on? Yes, he is. Excellent. Much love for you, Gary. Always watching, always there. <laughs> so, how's the uh, how's the sound level, guys? We're we're working off a different setup right now. That is a horrible picture for the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little we got a little sheen going on here. <laughs> So eventually this thing will catch up. Did they say the sound is all right? Um, I was just listening to it. Of course, I got my phone turned down, but. All right, well, welcome to Downtown Tactical Tactics Tips and Training. Uh, downtown Tactical, we are a local firearm gear equipment and training school that is not located downtown, but we have the gear and equipment needed to make it safe for you to go downtown or anywhere in town. So find us on East Battlefield Road in Springfield by the UPS store and the Hill Restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, so, it looks like it might be working. Yep, it's working. It's been working? Yeah, it's working. All right, excellent. Hopefully it's not as fuzzy as my screen makes it look, because it might be funny if I take my shirt and start running over the camera. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. All right, make it happen. <laughs> Sorry, internet world. Hey, there's some guy named Graham Hunt watching. <laughs> am I watching? Uh, yeah. Oh, it must be watching. Oh, so, I'm, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, we're going to be... <laughs> it's just now catching up. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to be doing things a little bit different. We, we should be streaming on YouTube here pretty soon. We're not right this second. It's just on the, uh, uh, on the Facebook. Um, but we're going to try doing things a little bit different. See if we can't maximize our social media audience um, sound is good thank you Gary appreciate it and uh, welcome so hopefully this format will work we'll try to improve it as we go along and and try to make it a little bit better improving the backdrop so if any of you out there can make fancy backdrops um, we'd like to know about it oh yeah and you can do that at show topics tips feedback any of that stuff you can email us at radio radio at downtown tactical Dot com. Um, so today we're going to talk about some stuff like uh, maintenance and holsters and mm -hmm. uh, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, let's start off with some of the holsters. Um, some of the shows that we did before, we talked about, you know, diff what makes a good holster. That's not what we're talking about here. We're going to talk about the different ways to carry, advantages and disadvantages um, with those various ways to carry. Yeah, so of course we've got your the ones. Let's start off with what we just don't recommend. Right. So that would be the off body carry, unless you are just out of options and you have to show up to wherever you are in a lycra swimsuit. Okay, um, in which case that would be very difficult to conceal on body, unless you're, you know, uh, gonna do something incredibly weird. Um, so off body, uh, the problem with off body carry is that you don't have your gun with you. It's easy to set a bag down. It's easy to put it beside your desk. It's easy to walk off and get a cup of coffee and forget it. Um, so you gotta have the gun accessible to you all the time. That's just how that is. If you're gonna carry the gun, you need to be responsible for it. You can't leave your gun sitting around. Well, and think about this too. So attackers, uh, I'm going to speak specifically to the to the ladies okay. here. Yep. So um, you've got all those concealed carry purses, and, and there's a good time, and a, there are opportunities to carry there, and I'm not saying that you should never carry there, but we're going to speak in kind of generalities. Generally speaking, it's not the best place to carry. On body is preferred. If you think about this, if, if, if you've got an attacker coming, 
they're going to likely grab you. If they grab you, they're not just going to grab you and hold still. They're going to grab you and move you around. Thus, your hands are going to be trying to get their hands off of you, right? Now imagine trying to get through that concealment portion of where the gun is hiding. Um, try to get into all those different areas to try to get that gun out. It's not going to work very well. The purse is going to get caught on it. Material is going to get caught on it. Your hand's not going to get in there. There's usually a zipper that gets in the way. All these different pieces trying to access the firearm in a situation that you're fighting off an attacker. Yeah, it's, it's not practical from a accessibility standpoint. Um, and the worst case scenario is that you're, you're looking at your phone, got your head down, something, somebody comes by and snatches your purse, now they've got your gun. Exactly, which is the second point there now. Now you've armed the, band guy, the bad guy, right? Um, now think about if you're carrying in your purse and you don't have one in the chamber. So now you're also trying to rack the gun. Hopefully you don't short stroke it because you're in a stressful situation, but you're trying to use both hands now to get the purse, fight off an attacker, and um, rack around. And Gary brings up a great point, still in my thunder, Gary, you won't always have two hands available. In fact, in our concealed carry class, we show that very specifically, male and female, the inability to rack around and fight off an attacker. So it's just not ideal. There are times where carrying off body is, is acceptable, but we're, in the general terms, it's not the best and there should always be one in the chamber. Yeah, so having covered that, uh, let's talk about the one place I really don't like seeing people carry a gun, and that is the small of the back position. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, Mel Gibson uh, in the Lethal Weapons <laughs> series did not do us any favors by showing everybody that you, could, that you could shove a gun down the back of your pants with no holster and so it would be pointed at your entire anatomy when you went to pull it out. Right. Um, those are those are just two things. Now, assuming you use a holster in small of the back position, and I'm, I've been guilty of this. Uh, when back when I made my own holsters, I carried small of the back uh, for a while. Um, but when you're talking about a violent confrontation, if you get pushed over and you crack your lumbar spine because you landed on your gun and you had both hands out trying to fend somebody off, uh, you're not putting yourself in a good position. So Gun small metal back period, doesn't, doesn't bend with the spinal bones and it, it's just not good. Yeah, yeah. Hard steel on bone, not a good situation. So rather than carrying small of back, since we're already there, let's just move a little bit forward. 4.30, 5 o'clock, somewhere between your hip bone and your tailbone, in between the that's an acceptable position. Yes, with a holster. Remember, everything with we're talking a, about from yeah. now on out has a with, holster involved. With a holster, and I mean, the holster should be secured to something. We're not talking about the sticky holsters. The holster should be secured to your to the fabric of your pants or um, to a belt. It, it should be secured, and it should hold your firearm securely, meaning it's not a universal fit holster. It's not one of those collapsible, squishy vinyl holsters. It's It's designed for the gun that you're carrying and it has some sort of some level of retention even if it's simply friction retention right like a kydex holster right even if it's that at some level of retention so the gun doesn't come out when it's not supposed to um, it, how bad would it be if you get knocked over and your gun goes sliding across the room and you're trying to get to it and fight off an attacker it's just not a good situation yep um, or you could be, unfortunately, you know, dancing and doing backflips and your gun goes shooting across the room, too. Oh, like an FBI agent. Oh, like an FBI agent, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they covered that at Quantico. Yeah. Uh, no. In, in the training. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and and picking up improperly and making it go bang and shooting oh, yeah. somebody, also not a good situation. Not a great thing. No. Uh, so carrying at 435 o'clock. So some advantages and disadvantages. And already mentioned, like, how it should be carried. If you're a male and you're carrying in that position. Um, anatomically speaking, men don't generally have butts. That's true. Right? So when you when you carry in the 435 o'clock, you probably will be adjusting your pants a lot, right? And those are target indicators. You're kind of giving away that there's something that's causing your pants to, to sag down. If somebody is looking for 
the if they're intent on causing harm somewhere and you're the guy that is constantly adjusting your pants there's some indicators there that, that maybe you've got something that would stop this person who's intent on causing harm so that you're drawing attention to an area that you don't want to also when you're carrying that the 4 30 or 5 o'clock position although standing up it may be very concealed um, if you have to tie your shoe or get something pick up something off the ground there's a very high, high possibility that that is going to print and now everybody can see uh, I used to when I worked in a cabinet shop um, when I first started there I was carrying at a at about a four o'clock 430 position um, found out really quick that in my cabinet year of shorts and a t-shirt um, carrying at a, at a four o'clock position um, constantly mean, meant that my my gun was poking out the side of my shirt um, so that did not work for me and I made a change and in case you're wondering that's what we mean by printing is that your attire is giving away that there is a gun there because the outline of the gun is is showing which would be the pistol grip in that circumstance uh, so granted you can layer I mean we're getting into the colder months so if you're layering a bunch of clothing and it's thicker clothing 4 35 o'clock may work you may not print but the likelihood that you are printing is high here's a way that you can find out when you put it on and you get dressed instead of looking in the mirror standing up bend over to your shoe hopefully you're still able to see the mirror get into a position where you can and see if it's making an outline where your gun is at if it is then that may not be the ideal position for you to carry in and another another thing that you can do is if you're if you're set on carrying at the four four to five o'clock position there um, learn how to bend over learn how to get things off the ground mm -hmm. without bending at the waist, bending at the waist yep. and, and showing everybody that you've got a gun yep. bend down at the knees reach down pick it up he, all of these things can be worked around you just have to be aware of it um, another disadvantage to carrying at the four four thirty five o'clock four or five o'clock whatever you want to call it um, the disadvantage to carrying there is accessibility especially if you're in a car it is more comfortable to carry there than some of the other positions but if you're in a vehicle carrying in that position uh, is going to make it a little bit more challenging for you to get to the firearm in the event that you need to likewise if you're in an office setting and you're you've got the back of a chair sitting there it's it's probably going to make it difficult for you to get to the firearm mm -hmm. and all of these can be worked around but there are things that you should be aware of. Um, one other uh, possible limiting factor to the four o'clock carry position is physical mobility. Now, I, for example, I have a, a torn right rotator cuff and a torn left rotator cuff. Um, and I recently, uh, when I was down in uh, Camden, uh, role playing for the fight, um, managed to aggravate that rotator tough uh, rotator cuff, cuff tear um, so for me if I was to carry at a four o'clock position I I have a, a lot of trouble getting my hand back to that position right now with the way my shoulder is so for that reason I've gone to the appendix carry which we haven't got to yet no we haven't got to we'll that get yet. there we'll get there um, so let's talk about uh, right on the dividing line um, we get a lot of people that like to carry directly on their three or nine o'clock. Right on that hip bone. Right on that hip bone. That's probably number one, the most uncomfortable place that you can carry a gun. Inside the waistband. Right. Inside the waistband specifically. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's also the least concealable uh, by and large. Yeah, your body, um, think about it. Your, your body is bending in that. Now, granted, your frame may be different. You may have a little bit more wide here and a little bit more here and make it okay, but your body is bending there. The pistol grip's not bending. <laughs> it's sticking out. Right, right it's there. just sticking straight out. Yeah. It's not It's not in line with the, the side of your back. It's not in line with the front of your abdomen. It's just hanging right out there at an odd degree. Um, you're going to have to wear bulky clothing to cover that up mm -hmm. yep um, and we'll get to outside the waistband in a moment um, moving more forward the inside the waistband in an appendix carry probably the position that that um, 
I hear about the most as being the most uncomfortable. Uh, I don't know that there's a way to truly make it comfortable, uh, depending on the size gun that, right. you're, that it, you're wearing. I it, mean, it just depends. I've actually heard friends that say it's more comfortable to carry a longer slide gun um, appendix than it is to carry a shorter slide gun. Um, in the because the way the belt and the pushing and well it's just the fact that the barrel will tend to lie flat against your thigh mm -hmm. um, and the rig doesn't move right so uh, the the challenge so I, I carry appendix and, and and I enjoy carrying appendix but it's it's not it's not something that you can just start doing and expect it to be comfortable like like a 435 o'clock position. Right. Uh, you're gonna notice it. I mean, you've got a lot of movement that happens at the front of your waist. Um, from sitting, standing, walking, bending, twisting, all of the different things that you do, there's a lot of movement that happens there. Getting a holster that's shaped properly uh, and, and having the right attachment for it to attach to you. So whether it's a, an ulti clip or a reinforced nylon belt loop, um, having a solid belt for it to clip to or having um, some solid fabric for that ulti clip limits some of the motion that takes place but you're gonna find you're gonna have to kind of work with it to see if you're gonna be closer to the belly button or if you're gonna be closer to the hip bone it's you're gonna want to move it around based on how it works and you may want to cant it you know to figure out what works best for you Gary talks about right now he's carrying a Glock 17 and a Glock 19 dual appendix so I carry mm -hmm. a, a 43x and a 19 dual appendix sometimes and I used to carry two 19s so yeah it's definitely doable um, it's a uh, <laughs> completely doable but you need to upsize your pants you know you can't you're, you're talking about putting an extra couple of inches between you and and your your belt and so you need to upsize your pants make sure you've got a good belt um, those pieces can make a difference and as I mentioned the shape of the holster the material of the holster all that stuff matters it, it it's not all one size fits all um, yep, so Gary mentions the Green Force Tactical du Dual Burkett. We make holsters here too, um, but you know not all of them are the same. So it may, it may take some trial and error mm -hmm. to figure out what's going to work best for you and the, and the gun that, that you're carrying. And the thing is, is if you're having a problem with that, don't get bogged down. Um, don't sit there and, and try it one time with, okay, we had, we had a, a customer that came in, bought a holster um, came back an hour and a half later wearing the same pants that he had left in which were already a size too small um, claiming that it was not comfortable uh, be honest with yourself um, take a good look in the mirror ask somebody else that you that is a friend and say hey are these <laughs> does, are these well, pants too you, tight you, you gotta I mean, think about it I mean you're putting that much extra space over that much area, mm -hmm. right, that you're going to have to accommodate for. And depending on your style, I mean, maybe you like really tight jeans, in, in which case that isn't going to really work out well for you. You're going to need some room in the waistline. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, you know, you can make it work. You're just going to have to figure out, you know, some, some wardrobe changes to try to make that work the best for you. Yeah, and, and it's all about priorities. Do you want to have a gun or do you want to wear snug-fitting clothing? There you go. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's that easy. Yeah, it, it, which is mindset. Yeah, it's, it's mindset. Do you want to be ready or not? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, now talking about the same thing um, outside the waistband. So we've we've talked about inside the waistband areas that we don't recommend. Uh, outside the waistband, I'm I'm pretty much going to say, hands down, unless you're layering and it's covered, there's really not a time to be carrying outside the waistband unless you got a rifle slung and you're planning on being in a fight. Yeah, um, outside the waistband is, uh, a lot of people say, well, if I want to go hunting, that's my backup gun, or I'm going hunting during handgun season. Um, okay, fine, you're on private property, hopefully. Um, if, you, if you haven't, if you tried hunting on public land here in Missouri, it's not strongly not recommended. There's a lot of yahoos out there. Um, so if you're going to be carrying in some sort of environment like that, okay, I understand that. People expect to see you with a handgun. 
Um, I do not encourage open carry as a regular daily thing. Um, and we've talked about it on the show why. So if, right. if you're curious, you know, rather than taking up that time on, on today's show, go back and look at some of the previous ones where we where we talk about that because there's real reasons. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. And it's they're germane and pertinent. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're um if and if you are gonna carry outside the waistband, um have have retention. Um, have some retention on there, whether it, like Graham said earlier, whether it be um, a, a friction fit retention um, or some sort of a thumb drive system um, where you can get your gun out and, and access it quickly. Um, have that. Uh, don't have a strap over the top of the gun. If you, uh, um, if you want to shoot Old Westy revolvers, then by all means you're going to be open carrying probably. Um, and you'll probably be in some sort of a practice uh, arena or competition, I would hope. Um, we've got enough things going, uh, there's enough public opinion being swayed against um, responsible gun owners uh, that the last thing we want is to be labeled yahoos um, by open carrying in public spaces. Well, and you mentioned the locking system. Um, outside the waistband, I mean, you've got your Kydex, right, that is your friction retention, but then you have ALS and SERPA. Um, those are the, the most prominent. Um, essentially, those are locking devices. One is by Safari Land, one is by Black, Black Hawk. Um, the Safari Land has a thumb retention, so you press down when you, when you grab the firearm, your thumb comes in contact with a lever and unlocks the gun and brings it out. The other one is... One like that over there. Okay, yeah, grab it. The other, the other one is a, is a Serpa. Serpa has a locking mechanism that you use your trigger finger when pulling the gun out. You press the button and bring it. There are some issues with the Serpa style in, in the fact that it's one, it's easily defeated by a pebble and you won't be able to get the gun out. The other is that um, in that process of grabbing your firearm, you're, you're pressing with your finger and it's very easy for that finger press to continue and cause the gun to go bang when you didn't mean it to. When it comes out of the holster and comes up, you continue the pressing. I realize that at the range that doesn't happen, but you're talking about in a fight. The ALS style, I don't, is this one ALS? This one's that, not. That one's not, but it's got a similar the, mechanism. This style mechanism, the the firearm is pressed, this is a lefty, is pressed when you're, when you're coming out and grabbing it, getting a good firm grip, you're pressing the button here and bringing it out. Um, very similar to the ALS style that we were talking about, but the ALS is obviously a, a, a branded term with Safari Land. Um, that's a better system than, than the, the Serpa where you're mm-hmm. pressing with your finger. Yeah, I call those the holsters of death because not only do you have a great chance of ending your gun when you're drawing it, Um, Also, if you get anything jammed into that lever, um, be that dirt, be that clothing, hair, whatever, it will jam that gun up and you will not get that out. And there's plenty of videos if you just do a Google search and see Serpa um, holster stuck. You'll see videos where law enforcement were training with it out in Arizona and, and some sand and dirt got in there and they couldn't get the gun out. In fact, it broke off where the screws were and they ended up having to cut the gun out of the out of the holster. They could not get the gun out. That's not a situation I wanna be in. So be mindful that not every holster is made the same and what looks cool and, and is marketed for everyone is just not the best always. Yeah, you have to, uh, you have to use your own, your own brain, not just take other people's word for it. Yep. Uh, so those are the methods of carry around the waist. Uh, you then have a couple of other options that are pretty mainstream, and one is shoulder holster. Um, and, mm-hmm. and a shoulder holster can be utilized for some deeper concealment when you have some outerwear on. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't just. It's not just for running around Nakatomi Plaza with no shoes. All right. <laughs> Um, but let's let's talk about the the mechanisms of the shoulder holster and how that works. Um, the first thing about the shoulder holster is which way is the gun pointed. 
Um, the ones that point down, okay, I can see that. Um, I'm a bigger fan of those than the ones that point out the back. Uh, just because if it's pointed down fairly mu pretty much throughout the course of your day, it's going to be pointed in a safe direction. Uh, the ones that point out to the rear, maybe not so much. Um, you have to make sure that those are, that have that any retention mechanisms that they have on there, usually some sort of a thumb brake strap, mm -hmm. um, that those are absolutely good to go. Um, they also have the ones that are molded to the gun. So you have right. some that are not the universal soft squishy vinyl. Mm -hmm. They have some that are molded to the gun and generally have pretty good retention. The one thing that you really need to think about, aside from, I mean, when it's holstered, where it's pointing at all times, um, the direction of it matters in that regard, but also the draw. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, in most of those situations, when you bring the gun out and you're turning it, at some point you're pointing the gun at yourself. Oh yeah. And it's not simply up and out. At some point you're pointing the gun to yourself. As a, as a daily carry, I, I just don't recommend that. Now there are options where there's times or, or circumstances where that is what you need to do, but you need to train with it. And you need to train to fight with it that way if that's how you're gonna carry it and make sure that it's something that works. Now some of the ranges, like ours included, you're not gonna be able to carry a shoulder holster uh, and train, so you're gonna have to find that place that you can because we're not gonna have a bullets pointed towards our students behind the firing line when you're trying to draw that gun. But you should be trying with dry practice and, and seeing if this is something that's gonna work for you. Um, personally, I don't think shoulder holsters are that comfortable. Yeah, um, I, I, haven't, I have not spent enough time in a shoulder holster um, to give a definitive answer one way or the other, but for me, the time that I did spend in a shoulder holster, it was always off balance. It was always trying to pull yep. me one, pull yep. me the way the gun was going. And, and typically, it, there's magazines on one side, and there's there's um, gun on the other, and there's different ones that are attaching to your belts, and there, I mean, there's a whole lot of different configurations that try to make it even. But I, I felt the same way. One side of my shoulder, after eight, nine, ten hours of wearing it, mm -hmm. was a little off. Now, if I'm running around the house and I'm in sweatpants and this, that, and the other, sure, I'm gonna throw on a shoulder holster. I mean, it allows me to carry my firearm and it's not gonna pull my sweatpants down. But train with it and realize that it may not be ideal all the time. Yeah, and when, if I'm running around this, the house in sweats or basketball shorts, what I actually, I use an ulti-clip holster. Um, that's what works for me. My it's sweatpants are a little bit for, looser. Uh, mine have a drawstring. <laughs> mine have a drawstring. Uh, there's a, there's a, Those drawstrings don't last, man. Those there's, suckers. There's, a, there's actually a picture out on, on, the green, on one of the Green Force tactical pages uh, where I am, I am deep concealment with a uh, appendix carrying a Glock 19 in uh, pajama, pajama pants <laughs> where, I, where I have put the soft loops around the drawstring. And, yeah, good stuff. Good yeah, stuff. Um, it's going to come into situation dictates. How what are you trained with, and do you know how to draw it, and do you know how to draw it safely without violating one of the four rules? Um, and and the one specifically I'm referring to is never let the muzzle cross anything you're not willing to shoot or destroy. So having the having the firearm pointed, you know, from a from a shoulder holster position down or backwards, doesn't always in my opinion, cover, give you the coverage from the four rules. And so you're gonna to have to figure that out. Yeah, um, because being responsible for what happens to that gun, what happens around that gun, uh, falls to you. Um, you're the person that decided to carry that gun. So that's on you. Uh, another place to carry is the ankle, right? That's mm -hmm. another, another spot. We're not gonna get into all the different places. The ladies have a few more options, they've got um, girdles and or, or what are these garters, things? Garters. garters. That's what I'm looking for. Garter, garter, garter holsters, and we're not going to get into all those. But I mean, I can understand like a garter holster being a good concealment if you're wearing a dress. Mm -hmm. You know that that would work. But the next one we're going to talk about is a uh, uh, ankle holster. First and foremost, it's worn to the inside of the off leg. <laughs> yep. <laughs> First yep. and foremost. So if you are right-handed, the ankle holster is on the inside of your left leg. 
That's where it goes. That's where it goes. <laughs> I've seen a lot of folks that wear it the wrong place. They'll wear it on the outside of their right leg or it goes to the inside of the off leg and that allows for a draw from either side. So you can draw from your right hand, you can draw from your left hand, but it's accessible in both places. The inside is because if you think of the curvature, first of all, how your pants are gonna lay and the curvature of your body. Having it on the inside is going to allow it to be concealed and it's not gonna have this big poof out from, from your pants. Right, right, right. because it, your pants are gonna to tend to lay more snugly along the outside than they will on the inside of the leg. That's just how that is. Speaking of which, you want to make sure that your, your I don't, I'm not a clothing guru, but whatever that is, the cuff or whatever it is around your leg, needs to be large enough to be able to be pulled up over that very quickly for you to be able to draw the firearms. So you're going to be looking caught. for you, Boot cut. The, the best, I mean, you may be able to get by with a straight cut. A boot cut is definitely good. Skinny jeans are not going to work with ankle carry. They just mm -hmm. won't. So. Get it out of your head. Uh, bell bottoms. Where are those? Oh, yeah. Back in the style. Bell bottoms. Well, what were those, those ones with the giant things <laughs> that uh, they were big in the 90s? I forget what the name of those were. Just oh call my them God. Navy oh. pants. Navy. If you're in the Navy, ankle carry is easy. <laughs> they, got, they got those those bell bottom pants. Um, but ankle carry. The way to draw from that is to simply drop your other leg, reach down, grab it. Don't bend over. Just reach, drop down, grab it, and, and go. If you're going to carry there, though, Come and take a, a tactical pistol course and make sure that you are drawing your secondary gun. That's not where I'd carry a primary. Carrying a gun there is going to be a secondary position and you need to train to pull the secondary gun, right? You need to go into a training position where you're forced into drawing, drawing that gun when you're training under stress. Yeah, um, you, if you're gonna have equipment, you need to learn how to, how to work it. Um, and if that's your primary gun, if that's a backup gun, if that's a pocket knife, you need to know what the strengths and weaknesses of each piece of equipment are and how to access them safely and effectively. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, you also want to train that side of your brain to realize that there is another option when you've uh, when you've reached for that firearm, you, or when you're running your primary, bang, 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 click, no more magazines, you're training that side that the next option is to go down and grab a secondary, wherever it may be. If you've got to carry somewhere on your waist, if you've got it uh, as a shoulder holster, if you've got it down as an ankle holster, or garter holster, or whatever the case may be, training yourself that that is where your secondary is, because lizard brain, caveman brain doesn't, doesn't know. Yep. And... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's important to, to train that transition. Um, uh, there's a, a drill called a New York Reload um, where you, you tip, they, it's typically done on some sort of a soft surface um, like, the, like your mattress or a carpeted floor, but it's done during dry practice when you practice uh, shooting and then the gun goes empty and you just immediately drop the gun Go for a secondary backup piece, or if you're going to go for your ankle, then practice the whole kneel down, grab the gun, and get up on target. Do not be like the off, like the police officer that carried his uh, backup gun on an ankle holster for three years without ever pulling it out in practice, and then on the night when he had to okay. use lock. his okay. when his. Yeah. Uh, primary weapon went down and he had to get that, what did he do? He reached down, promptly unstrapped it off of his ankle and set it on the floor because that's what he'd been doing for the last three years without ever having drawn it with the purpose of using it. So don't get into, uh, just don't get into bad habits um, that are going to end up getting you hurt. Thank you, Tactical Dust Bunny. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to move into the second part of the show. All right, moving right along. Uh, clear? So we're talking about um, maintenance. Yep. you got to maintain. you got to care for your carry piece. So one of the, one of the things that we see pretty, pretty typically um, when people are trying to trade in firearms or bring in firearms that, that need to be serviced maintaining their firearm in the specifics, lubricating their firearm, mm -hmm. um, 
it's typically not done right. And, and it may just be that that's how their dad or grandpa or whomever showed them how to do it, but we wanna cover how to maintain your firearm uh, a little bit more specifically. Yeah, um, and it's, it's not difficult to do. Um, if you don't have a firearms, a manual for your own gun that shows you how to break it down and clean it and properly lubricate it, well, guess what? They're required by law to provide you with one. That's why- As long as they're still in business. As long as they're still in business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh gosh! Now I'm trying to remember that the company that went out of business. With the... So, cleaning cleaning your firearm. So Hudson, this is Hudson, the H9 from Hudson. <laughs> well, there's been more than just they. I know, gone. I know, but that was the most um, spendy one, I think. Right. Cle cleaning your firearm anywhere that there's going to be carbon buildup, you're going to want to clean your firearm. So, um, when you break it down, just field strip it. You don't have to go into a detailed strip. Right, going and doing what a Glock armor would do, but breaking it on your handgun, breaking it into its uh, position of slide, barrel, recoil spring, and frame, mm -hmm. basically. Um, you're gonna wanna clean it all around. Just take a brush, uh, Q-tips, and clean all the way around. Um, when you're cleaning the barrel, um, think about the path that the bullet takes, right? So when you're cleaning your barrel, this being the breech, this being your muzzle, you clean from breech to muzzle. Yeah. Right? So the path that the bullet takes, you're putting it in this way, taking it out this way, not going back in this way. It, it's one direction. And then clean it, go the same direction again. And you're going to clean it until your land and grooves inside there are nice and shiny and clean. Now, and, and that's, to be honest, cleaning the inside of of my Glock barrel is not something that I do, I spend a lot of time on um, because that part will continue to do its its uh, its thing as long as I get, uh, as long as I get all the other uh, mechanisms cleaned and functioning correctly, uh, then the barrel is gonna keep doing its job. Christian Green joined. Hey, hey buddy. He says you have a good radio voice. Uh, thank you, Christian. I thought thank he was going to say much. you had a good face for radio. Well, uh, yeah, I do. I, I, do. <laughs> I do have a good face for radio. Sorry, we digress. <laughs> um, but depending on what you're shooting in it, the more corrosive... Uh, oh, yeah. Glock barrels and, say, a Taurus barrel are not made out of the same steel and aren't hardened the same. So the, you're shooting corrosive material in there. And if you've got a Glock barrel, then maybe you don't spend as much time on there. But if you have one of the other barrels that has thinner metal, it's not as treated the same, then you may want to spend a little bit more time cleaning it. Um, one thing to note, oil does not go in your barrel. Nope. <laughs> that's that's not a thing. No. That, that is really not a thing. Yep. Uh, well, it started, I think, with hunting rifles, right? Because the rifles are stored and they put oil in them so they don't rust. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I can understand that. We're talking about pistols. Um, oil doesn't go in your barrel. You're not going to lubricate those bullets going out. The lead is already going to do that. Yeah, yeah, the lead <laughs> will take care of that. Yep. So um, I just dunk my Glock in the swamp periodically. Um, yeah, I've done that too, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, Gary says Graham. I don't know what he's trying to say there. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, Gary, is there a question? Do, 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 do. <laughs> I just see LP everything. Am I doing this wrong? Uh, possibly. Um, Depends yeah, on how much. So Christian asks, are getting. you supposed to clean the barrel? Yes. <laughs> you yep. are supposed to clean now, the barrel. It's, it's more important when you're talking about rifles, when you're dealing with Milserp ammo, uh, than it is with handgun stuff, with commercial ammo. Um, but yes, periodically a barrel does need to be cleaned. Yep, and uh, it, it does affect the accuracy. If your land and grooves are getting filled um, by lead, it's, it's leading, then it does affect the accuracy of the barrel. So you do want to get that knocked out. It does matter what ammo you're shooting on the amount of leading that you may or may not experience, but you should clean the barrel, absolutely. Uh, and in the frame, you know, cleaning where it gets black and dirty 
cleaning in here. And I'll definitely tell you something. If you work in a dusty or dirty environment and are carrying your gun on a regular basis, you really need to get in here and double check and make sure you don't, or if you're just concealed carrying every day and you've got a cover garment, you want to get in here and make Move it sure. closer to the camera so you can see where you're pointing. You want to get into the guts here and make sure that you do not have lint buildup uh, in your trigger action. Okay, that is a gun killer if it gets built up enough. So we don't want that to happen. Let's avoid that by just taking uh, every, every it could be, you know, just pick a schedule. It could be every two weeks if you're crazy about it, every month. Um, some people just uh, will clean it after they go to the range. Um, I, I think Christian's trying to derail you with these comments. Yeah, he is. Yeah, Christian's trying to get under my skin here. Um, Dust bunnies may riot. They should, but they shouldn't be in there anyway. So they're already, um, uh, what is it called when they, squatters. They're yes, squatters. They're Don't give them squatting rights in your pistola, Christian. <laughs> uh, and then cleaning the rails. You know, cleaning cleaning in your, in your slide. You know, getting into these grooves and getting them all nice and clean. Maybe one day we'll do a video on how to really get in depth and clean a pistol. I don't think you guys have an issue with cleaning them. If you do, you can always email us at radio at downtown tactical and we can uh, radio at downtown tactical .com and we can help you out with that. But I want to talk about. You have something you want to say before I yeah. go into it? Well, let's. Are you, we're talking about where not to put lube? No, we're going to get into lube. And okay. Where not to put lube. Lube. So getting into the lube spot, and I want to start at the frame. The lube spot. So. Um, Oftentimes, people will just take, you know, oil and grease and just put it all over the place. Um, it doesn't, it, you can over lubricate a gun and it can create other problems. Glock specifically talks about putting it where there's going to be metal on metal contact, right? So if you're looking at the frame, I'm hoping that you can see this okay. Here, 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 and then right here. That's it. There are four tabs. Yep. Put some lube on those tabs. That's it. That's it. That's where you're going to put the lube. And a drop. A little drop. Just a little drop. A little drop. That's it. Just a little drop. You can over lube it. Don't do that. Um, if you overdo it, take it all apart and clean it all out because it, it, it does a couple of things. One, you get carbon buildup because when you're shooting it, mm -hmm. it becomes a sludgy mess. And that can actually cause springs to stop working because they get sludge buildup inside there. Um, moving on so, to the, go ahead. Yeah, um, another uh, another option um, for people that live or work in adverse climates, whether that be uh, extreme cold, extreme heat, high humidity, um, can be to go with a grease. Um, typically, I mean, we used to use, uh, I used to use a uh, wheel bearing grease. Yeah, like a high um, synthetic yeah, wheel bearing grease. Yeah, you spend grease. five bucks on it or six or seven or I don't know how much they cost now on a tub of wheel bearing grease and it lasts forever. Um, I've switched over to Breakthrough Clean uh, Grease. Um, works really, really well. I know, stuff lasts forever. Oh yeah, it lasts it works forever. great. Um, but yeah, you definitely need to, to put the appropriate amount of lubrication that will stick with your gun that will stay on your gun um, and not gum up. And Glock doesn't require very, none of them require very much, but Glock specifically, um, they'll tell you that they have self-lubricating properties in the in the Glock. And I think if I remember right from an armorer's class, Mr. Glock actually designed it to not require lubrication, though in their manual, they'll clearly tell you to put lubrication on there um, because of the different climates that you'll be shooting in and, and whatnot. But mm -hmm but they don't require very much and regular pistols don't require much either. Um, one of the things that sometimes I will do if it's been a while since I've lubed my pistol and I've been shooting it but haven't really been good on the maintenance, um, if I'm doing an oil change on my wife's car, uses uh, O20 uh, full synthetic oil, well, when I, uh, go to dip my finger in there to run run the uh, <laughs> to to wet the seal um, I will use the leftover oil on my finger 
having broken down my gun ahead of time and just bloop, 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 hit that with what I need and then I'm done. I'm ready for another three months. Uh, I'm loving your comments, Christian. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the Pistola uh, slide, this little spot back here, this is, this is the front, this is where your, your muzzle is. Back here, this is where your firing pan and everything goes. There is no oil that goes back here. Nope. At all. Do not oil firing pins at all. The, the firing pin chamber back here does not need any oil. In fact, you can cause light strikes and all sorts of problems by, by putting anything back here. So don't do it. Cause the hydraulic pressure buildup and yep. the firing pin won't move correctly. And we've got an engineer on here. Tell him I'm right. <laughs> right. Glock will tell you though, the rail, right here, the slide rail, absolutely. Put a little bit in there. It will already get there if you're lubricating this properly. So you don't need much. The other is Glock tells you because the, the barrel is gonna be sliding in here to by all means put a little bit on the inside of the slide, right? You can solve that by taking the barrel, putting a light film of oil or grease across the barrel. Because the barrel, when it's in here, every time you fire the gun, is gonna go like this. You've got metal on metal, you can hear it, mm -hmm. right? So you want, you want to provide a little bit of lube. If it's greasy at all, you've put too much. And right here, where these lugs are, right there. A little bit right there, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, That's all your lube. And one other place you do not need to lube is this handy dandy hole right here yeah, where, where your striker, pin. where your firing pin <laughs> comes up, okay? Just because it's a hole does not mean you need to put some lube in it. Um, that is another place where no lube is necessary. Yeah. Um, there's actually absolutely no lube is necessary on the exterior of the slide at all or any part that you can see from the exterior. So, yep. Um, literally guys, just a drop. It, it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole much, whole much at all. Um, it works and it will work very well if you just lube it up. But if you typically are carrying in your pocket or you're typically carrying concealed, take your gun apart periodically, every month, every couple of months. And Christian, I'm speaking to you, get rid of those dust bunnies. <laughs> get rid of the dust bunnies. I worked in a cabinet shop for two and a half years and carried a gun almost every day there. When I left that job, I went to go clean out my gun and I, ha I still have uh, built up, chunked up, it's not so much anymore because I actually went through there with an air hose and, and cleaned it all out, but um, there was still chunks of compressed sawdust in there. Now, it never caused me a problem because of the design of the Glock where it always has a way to flow out because of loose tolerances, um, but it could have if I had left it unchecked. So just mind your, you know, pay attention to what you're carrying. Uh, you want it to work when you need it to. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of <laughs> Christian, periodically he just shoots it. Oh, that, that'll work, it, you that'll should work do that. to a degree. Um, yeah. And a little bit more than periodically. <laughs> uh, occasionally would be a, a word that I would use more yeah. than periodically. I occasionally fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, questions, guys, on, on where to put oil before we wrap up this section? Uh, this is your chance to comment. I'm watching the comment screens. Um, I'm sure Christian's going to say something. It was nasty. I saw it firsthand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. My uh, my old Gen Three Glock 19. Uh, it it gave Tim some, some some a bad moment there when when I broke it up on the on the armorer's bench and started doing a detailed strip. And it just sawdust just kept coming. It it didn't stop. Um, you know, bad. I actually just thought about this, putting it back together. Um, when you put it back together, you should do a function check and a safety check. Now, I'm going to do one specifically for a Glock, but your owner's manual will tell you how to do it if you have something other than a Glock. First and foremost, you saw that I took and when I put the slide on, I racked it three times. Right? You notice that I let the slide go all the way to the rear and I let it go. I didn't ride it forward. I'm checking the slide lock making yep. sure that it is engaged and that the firearm is, is the slide is not going to come off. So this slide lock is functioning properly. The next thing that I'm going to check 
if I put this close to you, you can see that there is an extension off of that trigger. That is the trigger safety. So when I press on this trigger without depressing the trigger safety, it shouldn't give me a click, right? There shouldn't yeah. be anything happening. The trigger should just be stopping and nothing should be going. Once I've performed that check, it's time to go to the next one where I'm physically going to press the trigger. We all know that this firearm is unloaded. That doesn't take away the chance that, or the reason, it doesn't take away the fact that I should keep the muzzle pointed in the safe direction, never letting the muzzle cross anything I'm not willing to shoot or destroy, and following all of the safety rules when I'm going through this. So I'm not going to point the gun at the ground where it could, you know, this is a cement ground, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep it pointed straight up right here, and I'm going to take and I'm going to put my finger on the trigger. I'm going to press the trigger to the rear. It should hear a click. That worked. Last, I'm going to check the trigger reset. It reset. Everything is good. So they're, the Glock functions as it should. Yep. So just, of course, this is, these are basics. What, uh, what Graham has just gone through will be the same with any uh, uh, smooth-sided modern striker-fired gun. Um, particularly that has a trigger safety. Um, if, of course, if you have a gun that has more safeties on it, uh, you'll need to make sure that those safeties are engaged, particularly if they're- yeah. Backstrap uh, safety, thumb safety. Yeah, yep. need to run through all of those. Um, and then there are internal checks that we can do um, to make sure that, uh, for example, to make sure that we've got, uh, that all of the, that the other two safeties within the Glock are functional. Um, but that's more Glock armor level stuff. Um, be happy to, uh, what is an Elidian? This is a Glock 17, bro. Uh, yeah, this is, no, this is a Glock 17. It's Gen 5 Glock 17. Yep, it, it's, it's from Glock. <laughs> is that one in Austria or a Georgia? That's, that's a Georgia, Austria. that's an Austria, yeah. 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 Yep. Proof? <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, any other questions, guys? That's that's how to do uh, basic maintenance. Um, he's talking about the holster. It's an Orpaz. <laughs> Orpaz holster. <laughs> yeah, I picked it up from a guy that was taking the fight, and he didn't like it. And I said, I can use it for my classes to show them what an outside the waistband holster should look like to hold your gun. So there we go. It's a prop. Um, <laughs> it's not... So we recommend different holsters, as you know, Christian. <laughs> we recommend Green Force, NSR, Downtown Tactical holsters. Um, those are the ones that we, we recommend for virtually everybody. <laughs> Thank you, they Kevin. Because <laughs> yeah, they work. Thank you, Kevin. Guys, do you have any, any other questions? We appreciate you taking the time to watch the show today. Hope you, hope you like the new format. Um, we're going to continue to try to change it get some lapel mics or something so that you can hear us better and um i was just all asker <laughs> scared <laughs> don't be a scared don't be a scared christian uh, like i said guys I, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the show and we're going to try to broadcast this on youtube going forward but i have to figure out the whole youtube thing because they changed a bunch of stuff we couldn't just go live without yeah, a we tried. computer didn't happen yep, yep. so but, All right. Uh, yeah. if, if you do have questions, uh, I don't see anything going on comments, so if you do have questions, uh, email us, radio at downtowntactical.com. You're fine, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good, man. It, I love the comedy. Yep. I do. I do. It, it, bring, it livens it up a little bit. Um, what's the timing on an 81 in Monte Carlo? Google it. Yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. We'll be doing this again same time next week. So Tuesday, 4 o'clock Central. Um, <laughs> I love it, Gary. Love you, brother. <laughs> love you. Uh, we'll be doing this again. So email us, though, some topics that you want us to discuss because we just randomly pull these things out. And I'd really like to hear from you on, hey, why don't you do a video on X, Y, Z? Sure. We'll give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Show topics, tips, feedback. Radio at downtowntactical.com. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks. <laughs>